And everyone, welcome here tonight. We, we are so grateful to Pastor Zach that he's, he came out from Hungry Jan. Ever since I came back from Hungry Jan last year, I've been talking about their youth pastor, how amazing he was. Because you all know about it. <laughs> he has boldness. He goes in every school. He has an unashamed club. Whenever, last, last year, one, one time I had a chance, I was an intern there, I had a chance to go to a school with him and watch what they were, what, what they were doing in school, how they bring the gospel into the school, and how they change the lives, the lives of young people. And it impacted me so much. And today we are grateful that he's here, and we would like to call you up and God bless everybody. How are we doing tonight? We're doing good? Yeah. Amen. 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 I am grateful and I am honored to be here. Thank you for the pastor of this house, Pastor John, for having me. And uh, for those that know me, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Zach and I am 22 years old. I am the youth pastor at Hungry Gen Church. And just like Pastor mentioned a few times we are in local high schools in middle schools and uh, I've been a youth pastor at 19 years old so about three years ago three and a half years ago youth pastoring was absolute the last thing I wanted to do in my life <laughs> if you ask me what I wanted to be I'd rather be an astronaut or a firefighter but anything but a youth pastor I grew up in church and I've seen the politics of church I've seen the the burden, I've seen the responsibility of church, and I wanted nothing of it. I was a drummer, and I was okay with being the drummer. And I was like, you know what, God, this is as much as I'm going to serve you. Uh, I, I, will, I want someone else to be youth. I will hold their Bible, but just I'm not going to be it. And, you know, like Jonah, trying to run, but God got me somehow, some way. And so I'm hearing uh, what really touched my heart. And what really got me to be so passionate for young people, what got me to be so on fire for what I want to see, not, not ultimately what I want to see in our generation, but what God wants to see in our generation. I'm simply a vessel, but what got me to say, you know, God, I'm here, I'm available, is one time I was already youth pastoring, but I was, did, I wanted to be there, but didn't want to be there. And one time it was a room, probably the front row filled with teenagers, barely anybody. Um, and it was all my cousins that, you know, didn't like me. They had to be there because they were my cousins. Uh, they filled up most of the room. And, but there was this one girl that walked in. She was, I think, 15 or 16 years old. I still remember it like it was yesterday. Her name was Valexia. And Valexia walked in. I was like, Wow. There's a new person. That's a shocker. And she walked in, and I preached a sermon. It was a regular sermon. Nothing too fancy. I, I gave an altar call. God filled up that room, and she got encountered by God. She came to the altar. She got saved and began to just weep her eyes out. So I was like, wow, that had to be God because I know my sermon wasn't that good. And so I just knew God was in the room. And so I didn't think much of it until the next day. Next day, I wake up, and I'm going, to, I'm going to work, and I went first to get my Red Bull Dutch. Do you guys have Dutch here? Dutch Bros, that's not a thing? Red Bull? Okay. Just in Washington? All right. All right. So I went to get Red Bull and this energy drink, and as I'm going there, I'm in line, and my now wife, I got married three months ago, praise God. Amen. But my wife, but back then, she was simply youth leader. Amen. God works wonders. She texted me, said, hey, you remember, you remember that girl that came last night? I was like, yeah, Valexia. She said, well, she didn't just get saved. As I was talking to her, she told me that that day she disconnected her phone. She was planning on taking her life, committing suicide that night, she wrote out five to ten suicide letters and passed them out already, not for them to find out right away, but for, her, for them to find out by the time she was gone. 
and but by that time that they would find the letter, she would already be taking her life. Randomly, she got invited to our youth service, and God touched her life so much that after the youth service, she went back, took every letter, reunited with her family. Till this day, she's alive. And we can thank God for that right there. And I remember I was in that Dutch Bros line waiting for my Red Bull. And I was three cars behind the first person in line. And I remember the Spirit of God filled my car in that very moment. And I remember weeping, crying my eyes out. And I told God, God, I don't care about my dreams. I don't care about my goals, what I want to do in my life. If I say yes to you, I will preach the gospel. But I ask one thing, that you do this with teenagers everywhere I go. The teenagers that are suicidal will be saved. Teenagers that are depressed will be saved. People that are sick will be healed. People bound will be delivered. People that are lost will be saved. That the blind will see, the lame will walk, the deaf will hear. I said, God, if I say yes, I don't want the glory. I want young people to come to know you. And so here I am three, four years later. I love youth pastoring now. So if you guys ever thought, do I like it? I do like it now. And I, I'm so thankful for what God has been doing and just the opportunity to be able to travel. And we start we run a youth ministry for middle schoolers, high schoolers. We're seeing God pack out the place. We're seeing, <clears throat> honestly, a revival in our city. And like Pastor said, we do unashamed clubs. What unashamed clubs is, is it, it is a club that is ran by our students that are on fire for God. And they're starting and once a week in their schools, middle schools, high schools. We are now in seven schools. And they are spreading the gospel to all of their friends that are lost in the world, that are bound are addicted, that are without Christ. And we're seeing last year we saw over 200 high schoolers give their life to Christ in our local high school. Come on. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And so we're seeing um, this year we're really believing to release about four or five more clubs. And we're working on that right now as our school year just started. So God is doing some phenomenal things. And, and my heart's cries that I can come here and deposit and in part whatever God is doing at our church, Hungry Gen, through our pastors, through our youth ministry. And I believe that we're going to see even a greater revival in Canada, even a greater revival in your people, in our high schools, in our middle schools, in the people in Canada, in the, the people that are lost, the people that are bound, the people that are addicted. But before a revival starts out, out there, a revival needs to start right here. Before a revival start over there the revival there needs to be a personal revival before you know you get a few little twigs you get a few pieces of wood and that can start a wildfire that can start a fire that will that will burn through all the darkness in Canada all the witchcraft all the things that is happening in our generation amen how many of you guys believe that <laughs> amen come on somebody amen amen so I'm excited to the word to you guys. I'm excited to preach at our youth camp to all the teenagers, to all the youth that are going to be there. It's going to be a fire, fire time. I love youth camp. I love youth camp. And so we're going to go into the word of God. We're going to preach. We're going to listen. We're going to believe God to do something. We're going to open up the altar call at the end. Believe God just to touch people, to encounter people. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from Esther 4.14. I'm going to kind of summarize that verse. Most of you guys know this story. Uh, Esther is a queen. She's married and she's, she's hidden her identity, who she really is. Um, she was an orphan. She got adopted, all that kind of stuff. And she has a man in her life, Mordecai, is like a cousin, like an uncle to her, helped raise her, took her in. And they both agree not to really tell their identity they really are but then there was a there was a man um, named Haman man named Haman and Haman was the right hand of the king and Haman was not so good of a guy and he really sought out a plan to destroy Esther's people she sought a plan to destroy 
all the people. So as he is in the palace, he is coming up with this plan. He's scheming. He's planning. He's working how to destroy not just the people, but a generation, her people. But Esther doesn't pay attention. She's not listening to the plan. She's not listening to what's happening in her house, what's happening in her palace, in the place that she is living in. But thankfully, there was this man named Mordecai. Someone say Mordecai. Mordecai, Mordecai is what I believe that I'm here. I'm sent like a Mordecai to come in and, hey, maybe if you don't hear what's happening, I do though. And I'm here to tell you there is a plan there is a devil. There are demons that are out to take your people. That are out to destroy teenagers. That are out to destroy the people in our palace. And in, in, in our palace, there is a devil. There is a dark entity that is coming with a plan to destroy teenagers. To destroy a generation. To destroy people young and old. And, and we have to first know the plan. In order to begin to expose the plan. We have to expose the plan before we can expel every single thing that is in our generation. Amen. Amen. And I believe people, they want to know who, who God is. People now more than ever want to experience the presence of God. They more now than ever want to experience a supernatural feeling. You know, I... Uh, I heard of a story, there was this young boy in school, his name is Johnny, and uh, Johnny came to, came to class, and uh, as he was in class, the teachers and the students started making fun of God, they're like, the teacher started saying, hey, there is no God, God's fake, God's not real, There's no, that's just a hoax, it's a myth, all this yada, 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 all this stuff about God, and the students are laughing, the teacher is laughing, and Johnny is a Christian. And so Johnny's trying to figure out, how do I tell this teacher, how do I tell my classroom that there is a God? And so finally he comes up with something and he raises his hand and the teacher's like, yeah, Johnny, what do you want? He said, can I ask you something? She says, yeah, sure. Johnny stands up, he takes an apple and he starts to bite the apple. Like, okay, he takes another bite and then another bite. And they take another bite, and they're starting to get like, okay, what is, what are you trying to do here? He finally finishes the apple, and as he finishes the apple, he looks at the teacher, and he says, teacher, do you know if this apple was bitter or sweet? Everyone started laughing. The teacher giggled. He says, that's a silly question. How, how would I know if, this app, if that apple you're eating is bitter or sweet if I've never tried it? Johnny looked at the teacher and said, exactly, how can you tell my God is real if you've never tried him or encountered him or tasted him? We don't just need the explanation of God's power. We need a demonstration in our city. We need the power of God to show up like never before, to cast out demons, be with the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, lay hands on the sick and they will be healed, cast out demons and they will be set free, pray for the lost and they will be saved, amen, amen, amen. And I believe, I believe there is a plan in our generation to destroy our people. I believe there's a devil, the Bible says in John 10:10. the devil comes to kill, steal and destroy, but I have come has come. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. But we see in the story of Esther, Haman is trying to destroy their people. But Mordecai is coming on the scene and he's saying, I hear of a plan. Our people need to be set free. Our people, there needs to be deliverance. There needs to be saving of our 
people. There needs to be a deliverance from this plan, from the grip of the plan of the enemy, from the, the torment of the enemy. Because if, if you don't hear it, it's okay if you don't hear it, but I hear it. There is something happening. See, you, you have to know there's a devil in our nation when you see all the crime rising. When you see teenagers getting dr uh, addicted to drugs, committing suicide, then depression, society, and anxiety. It's not just life happening. No, no. There is a plan in our past. There's a plan in our schools. There's a plan in our generation. And we have to be spiritually mature, not to brush it off, but to say there is a Haman in my house. There is a Haman in my house. There is a problem in my palace. And I'm not just going to ignore it. I'm not just going to allow our generation to go to hell. I'm not just going to allow my family not to believe in Christ. I'm going to begin to, first of all, what you need to do is you have to recognize that there is a Haman in your house. And that's my first point I want to bring you. You have to recognize you have an enemy. You cannot fight something you don't know. You can't expose a darkness you don't think is there. Mordecai, see Esther didn't know why. Who knows why she didn't know. Maybe she was too caught up in her jobs as a queen. Maybe she was caught up in her beauty because the Bible says she was a beautiful woman. She was a well put together woman. Maybe she got comfortable being in the palace. Maybe she got comfortable in the position. That speaks to every single one of us. How can Esther be in the house, in the same house where her enemy is coming up with a plan for her people? How many of us are like that? How many of us used to be like that where we just came to church and we did church but realize that in our generation there is a Haman that's trying to destroy our people who's your people your family your friends the teenagers you go to school with those people that are around you and Mordecai hears of this plan and he takes action he runs over to Esther and this is where we get 414 he says for if you remain silent at this time relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your fa father's family will perish and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this for such a time is this see your deliverance your freedom for your life will come when you're more concerned about freedom than you are people's opinions you can't focus on people's opinions and try to get freedom. You can't be juggling, I want deliverance, I want freedom for my generation, and also, what do people think about me? What, what are people going to say? I, I'm in a royal position. I'm, I'm a queen. I'm a king. I, I'm supposed to keep my hands clean. I can't do anything. No, 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 no. Mordecai comes to Esther and says, you think you were in your position just to look cute. You think you were in your position just to maybe just maybe God put you in your position he put you in this church he put you in this city he put you in this state because he wants to do something through your life you weren't just saved to be saved you were saved to be sent to your people you were saved to be sent to your generation you were saved to salvage to leverage Come on, somebody. I feel the Spirit of God in this place. You were saved not to salvage your identity, but leverage your identity for the purpose of Christ. He says, maybe, just maybe, you were put in your royal position for such a time as this. There is a plan. There is an enemy in our camp. There's an enemy in our generation. There's an enemy in Washington, in Canada. And we can't just sit on our blessed assurance. We got to stand up. I, I love a quote that says, prayer is giving God permission to come on earth and work. We got to pray. We got to fast. The Bible says, actually I'm going to go to that part. But we have to expose the enemy. We have to begin to understand. If you, how do you know which tools to grab when, when you don't know which enemy you're fighting? 
You're not, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. The Bible says we're fighting against principalities, kingdoms, and powers of darkness, forces of darkness. We don't fight with fists. We fight with prayer. We fight with fasting. We fight with interceding. We fight for, for investing into a generation, investing into the church, investing into the kingdom of God. The Bible says our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Worship is our weapon. Praise is our weapon. But you have to expose because if we don't come to the point where we understand, hey, there is an enemy in our camp. Look, a thief is only as good as his ability to stay hidden. A thief is only as good as his ability to stay hidden. The moment you expose a thief in your house, his work is done. You're halfway there to your freedom. You're halfway there to your deliverance. See, most of the people, this is the big, biggest myth in our generation. The biggest deception today in the church. The biggest deception in, in, in Christian people is they think they're bound. But they think when they're free, well, they're really bound. They're really bound in chains. And the thing is when you don't expose the enemy, when you don't put the flashlight of the word of God, the light of God in your life and begin to let the word of God to examine who you're supposed to be, you will never be able to fight and expose and expel the enemy. Can I get an amen? amen. See, the devil is sneaky. The devil, what the devil is going to try to do is he's going to try to come in and come out with, uh, without you noticing. See, why would the devil, why would the devil come in with, you know, like those cartoons back in the day with the purple jumpsuit and the pitchfork? Why would the devil come in? Why would the devil try to announce his destruction in your life when all he can do is try to sow seeds of destruction without you noticing so that you don't come to the realization something's happening in my life? Because if you don't know that something's happening in your life, you will never try to expel it. You will never try to get rid of it in your life. See, uh, there was a story. I used to work at a body shop. And I used to fix cars with my family. And I bought these four nice rims. I don't know if anybody cares about cars here. But I bought these nice four rims. Um, they were 22 inch. Very, very nice. They cost about $2,000. And... Outside our shop, I, I, I set these four rims outside in this corner. And one night, a few days passed by, and one night I came to the realization it was getting dark. It was pretty dark. And as I was passing by the shop, the light, automatic light, when it gets to a certain point, darkness, the light turned on. And the moment the light turned on, it shined on this area that my rims should be at. And as the light shined, I realized my rims are no longer there. <laughs> There's a thief in our shop. See, this is like the word of God. If the light never shone on the dark area, I would never come to the conclusion my rims are no longer there. See, this is why identity in Christ is so important. This is why the Word of God is so important. If you don't know your portion as a believer, if you don't know joy is yours, how will you know when joy is taken away from the devil? If you don't know healing is your portion, by his stripes we are healed. How will you know to come against the devil when you get sickness in your body? If you don't know blessing is yours, the Bible says, uh, curse is a man on the cross tree so that we can be blessed if you don't know that's your portion in Christ in the word of God how will you know to come against the, the, the thief in your house you guys getting something tonight how will you know if, if you don't read the word of God if you don't shine the word of God in your life if you don't know your portion as a believer if you don't know your identity that I am the head and not the tail I am the first and not the last my family will be blessed Prosperity is for me. Healing is for me. Deliverance, freedom is for me. Salvation is for me. You won't know the moment it's gone, you're going to begin to notice. Why? Because the light of God is in your life. The moment joy gets taken from your life, you're not just going to sit back and blame God. 
You're going to say, no, 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 I got to stand up and fight for my family. The moment the devil touches one of your kids and you know your portion is me and my household will serve the Lord, you're going to begin to know stand up and equip yourself with the armor of God and say you know what I need to come against whatever's trying to touch my kids whatever's trying to touch my health whatever's trying to touch my family why because I know what God has given me identity guys is so important yes please thank you so much identity is so important the word of God is so important in our lives to begin to know who we are and what God has promised us amen So we see Esther. Esther comes to this point where someone else comes to her and says, you know what, hey, you got to do something. Because if you don't, relief is still going to come. Just not for your family. See, whether we believe that a devil is real, whether we believe that there is demons doesn't stop the fact that it's real. Whether we believe in God or God can do something doesn't stop God from moving. God will do something. The moment a light bulb switch, a light bulb stops shining, you don't sit there and whine about the light bulb. You switch the light bulb. God will move on this earth. God will bring freedom to our generation. The Bible says every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So whether we believe in it or not doesn't affect God. It affects us. So this is where we have to begin to step up and we have to begin to recognize there is an enemy in our generation. And I have to begin to know that John 10.10 10 says the thief only comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. If you don't know what, your, what is yours, you will not know what to fight against. Guys, my, my prayer, my hope tonight is even as I'm speaking, you begin to analyze your life and begin to say, where is the areas in my palace? Is there a something that is being stolen? Where in my palace? What is that palace? Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your business. Whatever it is, where in my life, where in my palace is there a Haman that's trying to steal, kill and destroy and I have to begin to expose it I have to begin to know what's the, my portion what is the plan what is uh, my purpose and, and promises over my life a thief is only as good as his ability to stay hidden but I what I love about this church what I love about even pastor pastor John is he's there is coming to a point coming to this thing where the devil's not gonna away with things anymore the devil is not going to get away with stealing and, and destruction in our generation with our people with our families with our kids in Jesus mighty name amen amen amen, amen. God is good as she runs to God not only she recognizes there is a plan there is an enemy in my house that's the biggest thing you you can't expose something that you don't know, that you can't, you can't expel anything you don't expose. As long as the thief stays in the dark, he will come into the house, steal something and come out. He will come into the house, steal something, come out. He will come into your health, put sickness in and walk out. And as long as you're like, oh, I just keep on getting sick, keep on getting sick, keep on getting sick. Is that your portion? feel like there's a hole in my pocket I, for anything I do I can't make enough maybe I just not disciplined enough there could be could be it maybe you got to stop with the Amazon Prime packages <laughs> or there might be a Haman in your house there might be destruction seeking at your doorstep today we're going to begin to let the word of God begin to be a light to the darkness. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you know the truth that God saved you, 
that God sets you free, that healing is your portion, deliverance is your portion, salvation is your portion. Everything that doesn't align with the Word of God has to come out, has to be removed from your life in Jesus' name. The second thing Esther does as she runs to God, finally she says, you know what, she snaps into it. You're right. Something needs to happen. And you know what she doesn't do? She doesn't uh, say, you know what, I'm going to get on social media and I'm just going to do a video and uh, release a YouTube video. No, 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 no. What she, the first thing that she does, she doesn't take advantage and say, you know, uh, I'm just going to look really pretty and I try to convince. No, no, no. The first thing she does is she runs to God. She tells them, she tells Mordecai, tell everybody to fast for three days and three nights. Run to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast. I'm going to fast. I'm going to spend time with God. And then I'm going to go to the king's court. And I'm going to plead for mercy. I'm going to plead for grace. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run to God. See, we have to, when there's something happening, when the devil's attacking in your life, when the devil's attacking our generation, when the devil, devil's attacking your family, you don't run right away to do a fist fight with the devil. What's a fist fight with the experience no 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 what do you do is you run to God you take the battle to the spiritual world the Bible says we're not fighting flesh and blood but principalities powers and forces of darkness so you can't fight a spiritual fight physically you have to take the fight to the spiritual world why because the devil is in the spiritual world so you have to begin to come in and you say you know what I'm not going to use my fist I'm going to use my knees I'm going to begin to plead before God. I'm going to begin to come before God. And I'm going to begin to plead for my family. I'm going to begin to come against whatever plan is in my palace. So she gathered a whole nation for prayer and for fasting. And you know what she did in this very moment? She went into the spiritual world. Before she did anything physically to Haman. She went into the spiritual world. And she crippled Haman in the spiritual world. You know what prayer does? Prayer goes before you. You know what you do when you pray for your kids, when you pray for your finances? You sending prayer places your feet can't go. You stepping into faith where your feet can't step into. And prayer does something, oh my goodness. When you begin to pray for your family, the devil gets scared. When you begin to pray, pray for your family, for your kids, for your finances, something shifts in the spiritual world. Even though you might not see it physically in the spiritual world, the angels, the, the, God is beginning to move in the spiritual world. That's why that says in the Bible, in, in, um, in Matthew 12, 29, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man and then he can plunder the house so you don't come into the devil and start no start beating up drugs no 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 you begin to come against every single thing you begin to pray you begin to fast you begin to intercede and what you do is you begin to bind that strong hand and then once you once you bind that strong hand strong man you walk into that house and you kick him out but what do you first have to do? You have to expose him. You have to expose his plans. You have to come against his plans. And when you come against his plans, you tie, you cripple Haman in the spiritual world. You cripple every single thing that is coming against you and your family in the spiritual world. And you come against it. See, in the same way, um, I don't know if you guys ever seen, have you guys ever seen how an eagle takes a fish from the water? Have you guys ever seen that? You never see an eagle go into the water and swim in the water trying to fight a fish. Why? Because on those grounds, the, the fish wins. Because this, the, this is the, the fish's territory. So what, you, we, what we want to do, what the devil doesn't want us to do, is pray. What the, the devil wants us to do is fight with him in the water. Why? Because he knows he can get you. Why? Because you're physically, what is going on? Uh, I'm just going to try harder. I'm just going to be more disciplined in my finances. I'm just going to try to eat healthier. And that's great. There's a time and there's a place for uh, discipline, but there's also a time and place for deliverance. 
there was a time and play you go into the water you're struggling but there's a time an eagle never goes into water and stays in the water the moment he gets the fish he takes the fish up into the sky because when when it's up in the sky the fish can squirm he can move around but it doesn't have any power up in the sky when you begin to take your problems your issues to God into prayer into fasting it's taking the fish out of the water the demonic spirit from where it's territory into the spiritual realm and you're beginning to come against those things with the power of God with the blood of Jesus in Jesus mighty name are you guys getting something tonight come on something I, I, I feel some God doing something tonight and and she doesn't use her beauty right away she doesn't use her power right away. She doesn't use her position right away. She doesn't like, you know what? No, I, I got a bunch of contacts. So I'm just going to like, we're going to gather together and we're going to come up with a plan to, to stop Haman's plan. No, no, no. She says, I know the first thing I need to do. The moment I recognize that there's an enemy, the first, the second thing I got to do is I have to run to God. God save my family. God, deliver me from this addiction. God, save my generation. My prayer is, God, I know there's a plan in my generation, in my schools. I recognize it. This next thing I do is we pray every week. I pray every day, God. I, I'm taken up to the spiritual world. I come against every principality over our generation. I come against every single spirit of addiction, a spirit of addiction to drugs, to suicide and teenagers. You know how many people have taken their lives, are addicted to drugs that are teenagers. I don't come here and just begin to shout at them, guys, don't do that. No, no, no. Before I do that, I go to God. I go to the spiritual world and I fight on the behalf of our generation. I fight on the behalf of every teenager. I fight on the behalf of every mom that's crying at night, every dad that's crying at night. And we take that fish into the, into the sky, into the spiritual world. We take that addiction into the spiritual world and we come against it by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. No, angel, uh, an angel came. I remember when Dan, in the Bible, when Daniel was praying, the, the Bible says Daniel was praying for 21 days and he didn't hear anything. And the angel came to Daniel and he says, I was sent from the first day you started praying, but I was fighting against principalities and demons that were trying to get, keep me from answering your prayer. Church, I want to encourage you. Don't stop praying for whatever you guys are praying for. God is coming. God is sending an answer. God is sending revival. It might be 20 days. It might be 15 days. Don't stop praying at 10 days. Don't stop praying at 12 days. Don't stop believing for your family at 14 days. Don't stop believing for your generation at 15 days. Don't stop believing for the salvation of your kids at 16, at 17 days, at 20. Because at 21 days, God came through. The angel came with the answer to his prayer. No matter how much you pray, the Bible says no prayer goes unanswered. God is sending his angels. God is sending send his Holy Spirit down to us to answer our prayers. It was so encouraging, you know. You know, when I started our youth ministry, you know, Pastor Vlad, he had the youth ministry running for, I think it was 15, 16 years. And Pastor Vlad, he got our, our youth ministry up. I mean, packed out. There was a bunch of people there, and then when it got handed down to me, um, I like Titanic. I sunk our youth ministry so quick. And, you know, I was young. I was inexperienced. I was an amateur. And quite honestly, the moment I took it on, I, I took it on because he asked. I, I didn't really, it wasn't a passion. And, you know, I began to pray one year, two year. And I was like, man, God, I, I feel like I'm losing more and more, and more kids instead of gaining. To a point where I actually, it came out of my mouth. I quit youth ministry. And my now wife, um, she was a good friend of mine back then. She called me and said, you are not quitting nothing. Like, <laughs> you're going to meet Jesus before you quit youth ministry. And I was like, oh, all right. That's when I knew she was going to be my wife. No, I'm joking. And, and she was like, no, you are not quitting. We're going to fight. We've been praying for this. I was like, yeah, but 
it seems like nothing happening. Don't stop praying. As long as there's a plan of, of the enemy in our generation, we got to keep on praying. The Bible says that, that the devil's roaring like a, walking like a roaring lion, looking who he can devour. We can't stop praying. We can't stop believing for our generation, for your family, in Jesus' name. When we pray, we create a spiritual battle. And can I give you good news? We are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. <laughs> Jesus fought for our victory, so today we can fight from victory. We don't fight because we're losers. We fight because we're redeemed. We fight because we're saved. We're not fighting from a position for victory. No, no, we're already on the winning side. We are healed. We're fighting against sickness. We are saved. We're fighting against every single person that is lost. We are free. We're fighting against every demonic spirit that is coming to torment and destroy us. But we are on the winning side. Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus, we are winning. In Jesus' name. And when she... Esther took to the spiritual world, to the spiritual world, to prayer. I love what happened. This favor came upon her. This, this boldness came upon her. The Bible says she came out of prayer and she says, no, she tells him, if I'm going to go to the king's court and if I die, I die. Imagine this. She went from hearing the plans and she didn't do anything. No, Haman was there crying. They sent, she sent some robes to him, say, like, cover him up. A couple verses later, Esther saying, I'm going to go to the king's court. And if I die, I die. Because in those days, unless you're invited to the king's court, they can kill you on the spot. So she made a risky move. But before she did that physically, she went there spiritually. Before she there with her feet she went there with her faith she crippled the, the devil in the spiritual world and she began to have a boldness and guess what happened as she came out of prayer and fasting she walked into the king's court and the bible says the king stretched out his scepter towards her and granted her favor and prepared a meal for the king and then the king said what do you want and she said i want another meal with you imagine that it's like hey just tell happening save your people but guess what she walked with boldness teen especially teenagers when you walk into your schools when you invite your friends pray because when you walk in you walk in with boldness you walk in with favor you walk in with grace on your life that whatever is against me the God that is with me is bigger than what is against me the God that is for me is greater than what is against me I am on inside and she went into the king's court and the king granted her favor the king granted her favor and my third point is your response will determine your outcome first one she recognized there's an enemy second one she ran to God third one is her, her response the Bible says here in Esther 4.14. For Mordecai tells her, if you remain silent. What is this calling? This is calling for an action. We have to speak up. We as a church, we have to do something. We can no longer stay on the defensive of waiting. Is the devil going to attack or not? We, we have to stand on the offensive and take back everything that the devil has stolen from us. Take our kids now my brother struggled with drugs for about eight to nine years and I don't remember a day where my dad didn't stop praying for my brother we as siblings came to the point where we said my brother will never be saved again my brother will never be healed again and he went from mental hospital to mental hospital to jail to here to there to jail to mental hospital back and forth back and forth the doctors claimed him to be mentally completely mentally uh, insane and my, my dad never stopped praying never stopped praying never stopped praying 
never allowed the, what the devil said about him to determine his response. Your response will determine your outcome. Deliverance is for everybody. He says, relief and deliverance will come for the Jews. It will arise. But for you and your family, you guys are going to perish. So if we don't step up, something will perish. It's either the plans of the enemy or it's going to be us. We are in a time where the devil's, the devil's playing out. He's almost not even hiding anymore. He's trying to destroy our generation. And what happened? As she responded, she came out against and she began to break her silence because her silence was going to keep her from her deliverance. Her silence would have killed a generation. Her silence would have allowed the plans of the enemy to begin to succeed in that. Esther went to battle. Because she realized it's either I go to battle or I'm going to stay in bondage. Either I battle the plans of the enemy or the other option is not freedom. The other option is bondage. My family will perish. Guys, we're coming to a point. Silence is no longer an option. It's either battle or bondage. It's either we're going to fight for our victory. It's either we're going to fight for our freedom. Either we're going to fight for our families. Or we're going to sit and watch our generation in bondage. You know, when we do our, I was talking to Pastor John on the, on the way up here. And I told him, I equip our teenagers to go to the schools and be a light. You know, schools and I don't know how it is here in Washington, it's scary. There's so much darkness. There's so much drugs. There's so much perversion. There's so much just a bunch of garbage in our schools. And it's so easy to begin to say, hey, let's pull our kids out of schools. Let's protect them. Let's keep them from it because we don't want them to do anything. Let's keep them from that, that battlefield of <laughs> high school and middle school because we don't want them to be in it. You know, when you keep them from it, one way or another, the devil's going to try to come after them. The best strategy is not to hide, it's to go into the battlefield. The best, the best strategy is not to try to protect our kids. It's to send our kids into the battlefield, equip them with the weapons of our warfare, to equip them with the armor of God, and begin to say, go be the light. Don't hide from the darkness, but be the light. Be the salt to, the, to this generation, and go see your friends saved in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. It's either battle or bondage. Your silence will keep you from your deliverance. I, I, I get reminded of, I get reminded of the man with a legion of demons. Remember that man that was chained. He had so many demons that he was chained up. He was so bound that they said even chains couldn't hold him. Even chains couldn't keep him down. Even though he had a legion of demons, when Jesus was passing by, the Bible says that this man ran to Jesus and dropped to the floor. No amount of torment, no amount of bondage in your life can stop you from opening your mouth. Even if the devil has 99% of your life, the 1% that God has in your life is greater than the 99% that the devil has your life if, if, if you still got breath in your lungs you can praise the Lord if you still got blood in your body you can praise the Lord you can worship God it doesn't matter how chained up you are it doesn't matter how much the devil beat you up if you got legs if you got hands if you got a mouth to praise you can come against the plans of the enemy you can surrender and come before God and God will give you the strength to come against it in Jesus name and we're coming to an end we're coming to an end and if I can have the, if you can play piano just for a little bit. He comes to her and he says, maybe just maybe you were born for such a time as this.
remain silent, it's not going to come. If you stay quiet, it's not going to come. You know, blind Bartimaeus, he was sitting on the side of the road. And when Jesus was passing by, he said, Jesus. And everyone turned around him and said, shut up. Don't say anything. Jesus is doing something else. And guess what blind Bartimaeus did? He shouted again. I don't know, maybe you've prayed a prayer before and nothing happened. Maybe you said, God, if you're there, save my family, nothing happened. Or maybe you still got the sickness. Or maybe that thing in your finances still happened. Or maybe your kids are still lost. I want to ask you, like blind Bartimaeus, like Esther, don't stay silent anymore. Shout the name of Jesus louder than ever before. You know, usually when you shout so much, the more and the more you do it, it's the, the quieter, the quieter, the quieter. Can I tell you, can I ask something tonight? May tonight be your loudest shout. May tonight be your best praise. May tonight be your best worship. Because Jesus is passing through this room. Jesus is in this place. The Spirit of God is in this place. And the Bible is, uh, uh, the Spirit of God is telling us, if we don't, stay, if we stay silent, deliverance will come. But God is saying, if you stay silent, it's not just a statement. It's a call to action. Don't stay silent. He wouldn't say, he wouldn't say, if you stay silent, if he wasn't intending for her to say something. I don't know what you're going through in your life. I don't know what things are in your life. Maybe some bondages, maybe some addictions, maybe you're just seeing repeated cycles of sin. You're seeing the, you know, as I was preaching tonight, you started to re recognize, hey, Maybe there, there are some areas in my life that, that the devil might be trying to do something. Hey, maybe there is a Haman in my house. Maybe there is a plan of the devil that is trying to attack. Maybe my kids are not just horrible. I mean, there could be a chance. But jokes aside, maybe there is something that's trying to steal my kids' salvation. Maybe there is something that's trying to take my health. Recognize. Tonight we're going to run to God. We're going to open up this altar. We're going to believe God to set people free. We're going to believe for God to begin to expose plans of the enemy. And begin to expel it with the, by the fire of God. We're going to respond to the call. We're going to live in freedom. Remember, what is your portion? I heard this story where this man, he had a father and his father was very wealthy. And uh, when he died, he didn't tell his son, but he created a will. He wrote a piece of paper that his son will have all his inheritance, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And you know, the father died and you know, they were figuring out funeral stuff, all that, all that stuff. And a couple months passed by. They gave the son all the stuff from the father that the father wanted him to have. He saw the piece of paper, but he didn't really read the piece of paper. They said, hey, your father wanted us to give you this. He was like, awesome, thank you. Took the piece of paper and he said, well, read a little bit through it. Didn't really understand. Put the piece of paper on in a frame because he said it's from my father. I want to remember him. Put the frame on the, on the wall. And for months and months... He walked past this frame, the will, the inheritance. He walked past it like it was just a piece of paper until one day one of his friends came up and they looked, you know, checking out the house, checking out the house. And they said, hey, what is that piece of paper? He said, I don't know, it's something my, my, my father just gave me. And as the friend came closer, he began to read what the will says. And the will says that the father is passing on all his inheritance to the son. All he has to do is, first of all, recognize that this is his. He has to accept it and respond to the paper. Take action. <laughs> and the friend says, are you serious? How long have you had this piece of paper here? He said, oh, it's been a few months since my dad passed. He said, do you not understand that this paper means you're going to have 
millions and millions and millions of dollars to your name. Everything your dad had is, is yours. You just got to take this to the wherever you take it and accept it. And he said, oh my goodness. I've been walking past this for the past six months and I haven't claimed it. How many of us are like that? We pass by the word of God that says freedom is your portion. Deliverance is your portion. Me and my household, we will serve the Lord. By his stripes we are healed. Curses are made cross so that we can be blessed and we're passing by this truth the promises for us every day but we don't claim it for ourselves today I believe is going to be that day that we take that will off the wall and we apply it to our lives and say God set me free God deliver me God heal me God save me God save my family God save my generation in the mighty name of Jesus Christ amen how many of you guys believe that Amen. Amen. I want us to rise to our feet right now. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you. And let's keep this atmosphere in this place. I'm going to open up this altar call for prayer. I'm going to open this altar call up. And I believe God is going to do something tonight. But before you can come up here and for prayer, you have to first recognize where in your life, you don't have to know exactly, but even is there something in my life that shouldn't be there is there a repeated cycle that it might not just be because I'm not disciplined but it's more than that or maybe it's something it's sickness and we're going to begin to believe right now for God just to set people free in Jesus mighty name so I'm going to count to the count of three if you say hey Zach that's me I'm going to ask you just come up to the altar and we're going to come up right here and we're going to begin to pray and we're going to have we have around here that are going to help pray and we're just going to believe that God is going to, Holy Spirit is going to encounter you. God is going to set people free tonight in Jesus mighty name. You guys ready? You guys ready? Okay. One, two, three. If that's you, I want you to just come up. Get out of your seats and say, you know what, tonight's going to be my day. Today's going to be my day. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. I'm going to open it up. A couple more minutes, a couple more seconds. If you're saying, Zach, that's me. I need prayer. There's something might be happening in my life. So I, I need to see freedom. I need to see a change in my life. And today is going to be the day. Not tomorrow. The, the Mordecai said, if you remain silent, deliverance will come from another place. Just not you. If you remain silent, some it will come. Just it will miss you. Today is that day for freedom. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Anything with addiction, anything with repeated cycles of sin, just make your way up front. We're gonna begin to believe for freedom. Thank you. Anyone else? Remember, I, I, I love to say this. I'd rather take a few moments of embarrassment, which is not embarrassment, than a lifetime of bondage. A lifetime of chains. A lifetime of addiction. I would rather take freedom. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's begin to worship. Let's just begin to worship. Everybody, just raise your hands wherever you are. singing out.
In Jesus' name, we worship you. to pray this prayer right now and I want us all we're gonna come and we're gonna begin to believe right now for the Holy Spirit to come into this place and we, I want you guys just to repeat this prayer after me say any uh, say every chain say every chain that the devil has used to connect me to himself in the name of Jesus be broken right now in Jesus name you unclean spirit, wherever you are, hiding in my life, in my family, in my health, in my marriage, in my finances, out, 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 fire, fire, fire. Say every demonic spirit hiding in my life right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Come on, I want everybody, if you can begin to pray, if you can begin to pray, pray in, the, in spirit, in the heavenly spirit, in the heavenly tongues, we're going to begin to pray. Worship team, you can begin to sing, and we're going to begin to lay hands on them. If you need prayer, come up. If you need prayer, come up. We're going to begin to believe for freedom in Jesus' name.
We worship you. We thank Jesus. We thank you, God, for everything, God, that you're doing right now. We thank you, Jesus, for everything, God. You're moving in this place. You're setting people free. You're healing people. You know, before, before I bring this night to an end, I never want to go one service without giving an opportunity for people to be saved. So if you're here in this place and saying, you know what, Zach, I'm going to be honest, I know about Jesus, but I don't know God. I, I don't know Jesus. I'm not saved. Maybe you're one of two people. Maybe you've never been saved. You've never known Jesus. You just come to church. Or maybe, number two, you used to be saved, but you slid back. You went back into the world. You, you gave that up. I'm going to count to the count of three. When I count, I'm going to ask you, if that's you, if you're saying, Zach, that's me, count me in that prayer. I want you to raise your hand when I count to the count of three, and we're going to begin to invite you and welcome you to the family of God. Amen. One, two, three. If that's you, just raise your hand. You're saying, Zach, that's me. I don't know Jesus. Tonight, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I want us all to pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for a sinner like me. I ask you, come into my heart. Make it new. Take my life. Make it yours. Take my sins. Wash it with your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right here, right now. And from today now on, I promise to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give our God a great praise in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Let's give it up for Pastor Zach. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. There will be coffee and snacks in the back there. You're welcome to stay and have fellowship. Be blessed in Jesus' name.